Good day, good day. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Jay, and this is Homeschool Your Kids Podcast. Today we have with us Colleen. Welcome, welcome. Introduce yourself. Hi, Jay. Um, great to be here. I love what you're doing, and it's it's really cool to be able to talk to you and to share information about what we're doing. So thank you for having me. Nice. Um, yeah, my name is Colleen Dipple. I'm the founder um, and CEO of Families Empowered. And Families Empowered is a not-for-profit that provides help to families who are looking for schooling options. We provide free bilingual service to families looking for K-12 schooling options. Um, and we've been doing that for 14, almost 15 years. We've served over 117,000 families, primarily in Texas, but also now in Arizona and um, in Hillsborough County, in Tampa, in Florida, through two organizations we're getting sort of launched and off the ground in those states. Awesome. That's yeah. amazing. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of families. Free, free bilingual service to families looking for schooling options, whether that's you know, a traditional school, a magnet school, a charter school, a private school, a home school, a micro school, um, you know, so a hybrid kind of a school. Um, so yes, we've been doing this for a very long time and hundreds of thousands of families. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you all um, host during uh, National School Choice Week? Do you all host an event? We do. We love National School Choice Week. So so this year, I actually actually went to Tucson for an event that navigated Arizona, which is an organization we're helping to kind of launch, um, hosted at U of A. Um, and then we also hosted a very, in, in Texas, Families Empowered hosted a very, very large event in Austin at the Bullock Museum. And then in Houston, at the, so we kicked off the week in Tucson on Friday. Um, Austin on Saturday, um, and then the following Saturday, the last day, we had uh, a big event at Minute Maid Park, which is the big baseball field in Houston. We had um, over 800 people show up, 2,000 people registered, um, and then our the organization we're helping to kind of launch in Florida also hosted an event in Tampa at the zoo. Nice. So, yeah, so yeah. we are all in <laughs> yes. on National School Choice Week. Because it's great, right? I mean, if yes. parents respond, parents appreciate it. They're yes. looking for individual options that are right fit for their children. And, you know, they appreciate people who support them and believe in them and, you know, trust them. Yes. <laughs> so. How did you get here? How, why, why did you decide that, you know, this is what you wanted to devote your time to? Well, thank you for asking. Um, <laughs> I started as a teacher Mm -hmm. um many 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 years ago and then <laughs> the the script I, the flip the script flipped it on me when I became a mom like mm -hmm. almost everyone's story it's life-changing that's real and it's also kind of a cliche but it's real right um and so I had my own son 18 years ago and we started thinking about kindergarten and um I thought it would just be easy, right? We bought a house where we thought we would send him to school and we made this big financial decision. And um, I went to the neighborhood school, public school, and they wouldn't give me a tour. They just sort of said, well, we're an A school. What, what, we don't need to tour you. And I was like, well, I have some questions. <laughs> like, how do you approach read? Like there were a lot of things I wanted to know and I wanted to see with my own eyes. Yeah. Um, because it's it was my child, right? And I was like, I'm not gonna send my child into a place where she's spent eight hours a day or whatever it is and not see it with my own eyes. That's insane. Um, and they said we don't do that. And I at that point Was it during thought, school hours? Like were there kids there or something? Yeah, like, but I mean, people tour schools all the time. Mm. And you know, you I was happy to go through security and give them my cred my, you know, my license and whatever yeah. and if I had to go through I wasn't like refusing to do it they were like we don't essentially what they said is we don't need you like we're <laughs> full we don't need you and we don't have to and I thought but mostly I was like they are not interested in really partnering with me mm. they're essentially like send your kid here we're in a school 
and don't, and we'll like, and the door is the spot. And I, that just it made no He's sense. like, drop them off, put them through the door. Yeah, and it made no sense. Don't ask us any questions. It's going to be a school where I'm not viewed as a customer. Mm. And I found that in like crazy. I was like, this is insane. Like, this is my child, right? Like, and I, if they're not willing to do this prior, and I then I said, well, I'm looking at other options. And they were literally like, okay, <laughs> where? And and so it was a really tough struggle. Um, and so we eventually found a, a private school that both my children have gone to. My son actually went back to public school. The pri- it's like we bounced around with other, like like a lot of parents. But I realized at that point, if I was having that struggle with the experience I had, I have a master's in education leadership. I have an administrative degree. i worked in the private sector. And quite frankly, I bought a house. I could buy my way out of it. I thought by like going to a zoned good school, right? Mm -hmm. Quote unquote, good school. (laughs) And I I was thinking what, and I taught in a title one school. So I was Mm. like, how, what is the experience? I then had the mindset of a parent. So prior to that, I had the mindset of a teacher, right? Like content, testing, you know, all the things you have to do, safety, all the things teachers have to worry about. And then I thought about it through the parent's lens. And I thought, if I'm struggling, there have to be other people who are struggling. And our my board chair at that point I said to him, I think there might be parents who are looking for school options um, and they need help. And he was like, well, let's see. And then there were charter schools that had very long wait lists. Mm. Those schools 15 years ago, there were two that agreed to allow parents to check a box to opt into getting service from us. And these are Title I schools. You're in Um, Texas? This is in Texas? We're in Texas. This was just in Houston. And that first summer, we had about 6,000 parents Mm. who opted into having support service from an organization they had never heard of back then. Never heard of us. And at that moment, that summer, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm not crazy. This is a common problem. And it turned out that the lowest income parents were the people who wanted our service and support. So fast forward 15 years, we are a parent organization, not a a family organization, not a a school organization. We don't Mm -hmm. work for schools. We partner with all kinds of schools. Um, And the majority of the phone, so we have a a five-day-a-week call center, Mm -hmm. takes phone calls and makes phone calls. 74% of the calls that we, we have are in Spanish. Um, the majority of families that we serve are identified as families of color. And of those, many are female led households. So we're helping moms and, and dads, but who love their children. Right. And we are serving and the average, our, the average family income for our families is about $50,000 a year or less. Mm. So these are families who love their children as anyone does. They want the very best. They want their children to be safe, to have literate, you know, to be literate, to be, you know, have have like basic numeracy skills. And they understand that a right fit is really important. important. And they just need a little bit of personalized service. And so we have live people, but we also use tech and stuff like that. But yeah, so it changed for me when I became a parent and it was very real that this was the highest stakes decision I felt like I was going to make for my child. And it was my decision. A five-year-old doesn't make that decision. Yes, and it was a very real decision. Like I was going to put him in a building with a bunch of people who are going to be responsible for him potentially. And it was emotional. It was high stakes. And I was flying blind. And the only reason I wasn't completely stressed out is that I had enough experience as a former teacher that I knew the questions to ask and I yes. knew what to look for. And that so. makes a big difference. Well, it did, but parents shouldn't have to go through that, right? They shouldn't. They shouldn't be but... alone. They should not be alone in this journey. 
And as our data shows, they're not, right? It turns oh. out, oh, by the way, as you know from your podcast, hundreds of thousands of people. Now fast forward 15 years, homeschooling, micro-schooling, potting, you have communities of parents who are self-organizing yes. in ways they didn't when I founded this. It was really like charter schools, vouchers, or magnet school, right? Yes. Like that was your only avenue. And then there were people homeschooling, but that has just exploded. Yes. Which to yes. me, that's like, that's self-organizing and advocacy. That's like, I'm, I can't get what I need from the system. I'm going to go and do this myself. And the great news is there are all these resources for people. Indeed. So that's why I love what you do. And that's why I love what you're doing, because y'all are making sure families are aware of their choices and especially the like important like bilingual families. And I've run into like, you know, um, Spanish speaking families. Like I, I ran into a mom one day when I took my girls to go play and she was just like, I just don't think I can homeschool. Like, you know, they don't think that they're capable of it in general. And I'm like, first of all, you speak two different languages, okay? I feel like bilingual people are like the smartest thing ever. And I don't think they recognize how smart that is to be able to transition between 100%. two whole different languages. Like, oh my gosh, please give yourself more credit. But they also, they're not aware of the choices that they have because a lot of them are new to this country or um, they're not just like, you know, I just, they're just not aware of the choices yes. as a lot of people are in general, are not aware of the fact that they have a choice in their children's education. You know, we're kind of programmed to think, oh, my child reaches five, six or whatever. They got to go to this building. Like this, hey, this is in our neighborhood. This is the school they got to go to. Boom, let's send them there. And that's yes. it. I think, I think it's also daunting to think about, well, I, 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 you hear parents a lot of times say, I don't know how to be a teacher. Like I'm not a teacher. And it's like, well, you actually are your parents. You're, you're your child's first teacher. First teacher. Yeah. You actually probably taught them all kinds of things, like how to eat with a fork, how to speak, how to go to, to be potty trained. That's a pretty hard one. Put their you pants know, on, how, take their pants. Yeah. Like, you know, just how everything. Yes. for help how to engage with people, how to, you know, open a Ziploc bag, like generally how to read. Like if you're reading to your kid, like you're, you're teaching your children, all, everything's a teachable moment. I'm at the point where I have teens. I feel like the teachable moments are very <laughs> real with teens. <laughs> like I'd love to go back to eating with a fork. Um, right. Just, you know, like, okay, here's why you have a curfew. Um, but <laughs> So, but, but I think that's first, you are always teaching your children yes. and you're also teaching the kind of people you want them to be, mm -hmm. right? You're teaching them about the kind of character and all these other things that nobody talks about at school ever, right? Like the kind of human being you, you want to be. So that, that's one thing. I think the second thing is it may have been true 20 years ago that it felt really overwhelming and you but but there's so many amazing resources, resources for yes. people who want to homeschool there are pre-made assessments there are curriculum there are communities like you know being online is allowed like i think people who might not otherwise consider homeschooling to homeschool Right. And then there are these small communities and micro schools to me are sort of these interesting hybrid homeschools. Right. Like they're for the people who are like, I want to homeschool, but I don't want to do it alone. I don't want my kid in an institution. I don't want to put my five year old in a building with 500 people, mm. none of whom love my child. Like, let's just call it, a, you know. Because at that point, 500 kids, 300 kids, it's a safety, it's it's a institution, right? So, so the idea that you can have these small community-based, um, you know, really humane places where kids can self-pace, it's the most rational sort of exciting thing I've yes. seen. And so to me, that's where micro schools are really interesting because it allows people to also sort of do something that feels scary with other people sometimes it's easier support, to jump together yes, than to yes. jump alone right yes and i love that micro schools at they offer a, a lot of them offer the a la carte like 
you know, approach where it's like, oh, if you just want to send your child here one day, or if you want to just send them here for this class, right. or like, I love that. I love that. Cause it's yeah. not no, oh, you have to do this. You have to, you know, it's still allowing the freedom of choice um, and what works for your children. So that's right. micro schools are that's amazing. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, the other thing that's really powerful about homeschooling um, and in some cases, micro schooling is it just, first of all, the primacy is on sort of the parent who I think is the first teacher, right? And then the other thing is it gives the child the grace of time. Like we have really created this constraint because we have adult contracts and we have physical buildings, right? And we have all of this like financial stuff tied to a calendar. That's the only reason, good reason that we have for having school from like, school is only from mid August to the end of May in Texas, right? Like you don't really, unless you're doing summer school, but what's insane is that wealthy people and middle income people are spending thousands of their of dollars to put their kids in day camps and this camp and that camp and tutoring. Because you don't just sit around in June and July and half of August doing nothing, right? Like even, even like when I was a kid, we did summer rec and we did mm -hmm. swimming lessons yes. and we did the library. I mean, we did a lot of like free stuff, like the summer free library program and mm -hmm. the parks program and whatever. But now, I mean, most parents you have two working parents right so so they're they're spending money because they're recognizing you don't stop learning you don't say well mm -hmm. you're gonna fart around and watch the simpsons for two months <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that's when you're like let's well, superpower your second language or math or you struggled last year in x or there's a science camp at the ymca or whatever it is yes. And year-round schooling allows kids the grace of like not having to cram it all into yes. nine months with a break at Christmas. It sort of says like you're this person who has to be able to be literate and to be, you know, have fundamental math skills like business math or whatever and potentially advanced math, but like really everybody should be able to understand interest rates, right? Like basically like that to me is where like, okay, not subject to predatory <laughs> lending at that level. We're not even hitting that in America with a lot of kids. Yes. So no, we're not. So if that's the goal, why are we shoving it? Like we've got these artificial constraints on when you learn certain things. Mm. And it's, I think really soul crushing for kids. I think it's also soul crushing for teachers. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I bet you talk to a lot of teachers who yes. are now parents who are like, oh, I'm definitely homeschooling. Well, you know, I was a teacher also. So <laughs> I tell people so you know. before I had kids, I used to tell people all the time, I'm going to homeschool my kids. Like, this is not where I want to send my kids. Um. <laughs> so remind me. So you knew that as a teacher. Yes, ma'am. Um, I subbed for eight years. So I was all over the class, like all over the classrooms. I went to in school suspension. I was in the front office, guidance office. Yep. Like I literally went through like every compartment that you could think of as a school besides administration. And I just knew that was not, it was not healthy. <laughs> Look, to sum it up, it was not healthy for a child to be placed in a building in those, like at with what was going on in, in that I vision that I, I was able to see and witness. It was not healthy. So I met three women this fall through Janelle Woods, who mm -hmm. is, you know, in Arizona and founded, as you know, the Black Mothers Forum. Yeah. She had hooked up through online, you know, the internet somewhere, I don't know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, who knows. Um, with three African-American parents in Dallas. Mm. And two of them were former teachers. And they decided to create this sort of this micro school and then found Janelle through, you know, just word of mouth. And she was really supporting and helping them. 
And these were, and the two former educators, I, I spent a day with them in Austin and we were meeting with a bunch of people and just sort of sharing their story and sharing our story and sort of saying, look, it's not crazy for parents to want options. Like they're not all trying to destroy public schools, but like their story was really compelling as two former teachers. And then the third was a small business owner. And they said the same thing. They said, look, our experience led us to really examine the way we've structured these institutions. They're too big to be responsive. We are institutionalizing young children. We're socializing them to be institutionalized. And we're not learning. They're not learning. I was going to say, and Colleen, ultimately we're wasting their time. In my opinion, like we're wasting their time. I My last couple years of teaching was in 12th grade. And so to see what 13 years accumulated, because I count kindergarten also. So just to see what that accumulates to as far as 12th graders go and what they have when they reach the end of the, oh no, we wasted their time. And we wasted, we, I felt it was a waste of time when I was in school, but you know, like that was just me and where my mind was at that time. But to see like after being in the, you know, as the teacher setting, no, we're wasting their time. Definitely. Public school is wasting their time. I had a, um, so my oldest was in eighth grade and ninth grade when the sort of COVID situation went down and it was a little better here than other places in the sense that like, if you wanted your kid to go back, they went back. And I, I was like, I kept saying, look, ninth grade is no vaccines. Like it's not a joke. It, those grades and that content gets sent to this place called a university. If you're applying to college, like it matters and it's cumulative, right? Like if you don't really learn Spanish in ninth grade, but they pass you along, you're going to have a really difficult time in 10th grade. It's a cumulative experience. Similar, It's similar with math, right? And all yes, these other ma'am. things. So I had, was really terrified with having a ninth grader. Like what is happening? So they, So the whole thing was not positive to your point. But I have, you know, a son who's not a super nerd. He's a super jock. And so all of his friends are very athletic. One of his super athletic friends, who I would say is wasn't a super nerd, is like your average student, whatever, said to me exactly that. He said, what I realized was how, because I said, are you happy to be back at school? Would you, you know, do, aren't you glad you're not in front of the Zoom anymore? He said, I don't know. I think I've realized how much time gets wasted. Mm. I almost like, like stop the guy. It was in the car. I almost just, I was like, <laughs> what? Like this is from a high schooler, right? Yes. And, and like, not, not a deep thinker, like a football <laughs> dude, a football guy. And he goes, well, you know, some of my classes, like I can just get through them pretty quickly online. And some of them I would like to go in and maybe like do the chemistry, like the biology labs, which by the way, they wouldn't let them do in ninth grade. They wouldn't let them like, so the one thing that like they, he's like, well, it would be good to use a real microscope when we're doing, like, it'd be cool. And he's right. Like, it's cool. It's swab your cheek and look in the micro, you know, microscope and all that. It's like, you know, and some things I might want a little help from the teacher on, and it would be cool to like go in. He's like, but, I could get a lot of that work done at home. He's like, and then we're farting around with study halls. And then there's like 45 minutes for lunch. He's like, there's a lot of wasted time to your point. And it's like, we're warehousing kids, right? It's, it's really soul crushing. And then the class where they do want to move faster, they have to sit in a 90 minute block, like, yes. wah, wah. You know, you think about it from your your perspective as a teacher and what you used to do in the classroom or just, you know, being able to observe because I could still see like, you know, so many kids just sitting there laying like, oh, like I'm here because I have to be here. Not that I want to be here, but I'm here. And so, boom. But while you're helping this student over here, because they're stuck on a concept that y'all covered like two weeks ago, but they're, they're there. So you have to address it. The ones who can move further, who can are ready to go and could have been done with the book or whatever it is by that time, they're stuck. They're sitting there looking. I think I think high school has got to be rethought, like Mm. from the ground up. 
there's a school in Tucson I'm slightly obsessed with that I think is very <laughs> cool um, called Pima J Ted. And it's a, it's a, it's a trade school. Mm. Um, but the kids are really engaging in meaningful work and it's trade school, everything from like phlebotomy to, you know, to, um, hospitality to like driving these crazy big trucks that are like hauling, you know, industrial concrete and stuff. I mean, they've got every, and it's state of the art. And then the kids do kind of work and they can structure the time in the day very differently, but it's really meaningful. There's horticulture. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, well, this, there's really not a lot of meaning in high school. So the kids know their time's being wasted. They're taking a bunch of classes. I don't know. Like, I don't think you should have to, we shouldn't be telling kids if you don't take um, calculus, you're going to be a loser. <laughs> That's a lie. It's a lie. Yeah, it is. It's a calculus. total lie. It is a lie, right? And and but here's what I'd say: if you can't balance a checkbook, if you don't understand that 19% interest rate is predatory rate, mm -hmm. you're going to be in trouble, right? Like those are some real basics. But is but that really even covered? You don't have to take trigonometry or calculus. Now, if you really want to go into advanced engineering, you're really a science nerd, but you're going to be motivated, right? Like if you're the kid hanging out in the physics lab, fine. But there are so many more interesting and meaningful ways to engage high schoolers. And I think when you think about dropout rates, behavior that's really like self-destructive that high schoolers engage in, I think so much of that's tied to boredom yes and they're like this is bs <laughs> i would say the full word but you know i want to be sensitive like because they're not dumb right like they're not dumb yes, they're not and i was looking at my son the other day um and he had these virtual reality goggles and he was playing a crazy game like i don't know football or kickboxing or i don't know what he does but um, I know that there are folks delivering really high quality content. So homeschooling, you can get these goggles and actually be in a surgical suite with a surgeon in real time, right? Like this is, this is so much more compelling. Like you can be in Egypt looking at a pyramid with other students from around the globe with goggles on from a tribal community, mm. right? From, you know, from your house, your kids can do that, right? So if you wanted to supplement something that's, you know, a reading with something that's three-dimensional and interactive and allows them, you could go to Japan, speak Japanese, and learn about like swords, Japanese mm. swords, or, you know, you could visit Hiroshima with these goggles. I actually think that'd be so much more compelling. And then you'd be more likely to read something about it. Indeed. Schools Indeed. are not doing that, but homeschoolers are doing that. So that's where I like, that's why I love what you're doing. Because I think we need to encourage more people to unplug from the matrix. Yeah, and I, I like I see it as a challenge because they have to be challenged in some way. Like overall, they're getting money for your child to be there. Like for a school to act like they don't need you there, they need your children there because that's how their funding is is sourced. So if you take your child out of that school and you challenge them to, hey, I need changes. Like it's like y'all got to change this. This isn't working for me and my family. And there's a majority level of families that are saying like oh no, this isn't working for us. So we're going to go do this until y'all get y'all stuff together. It will make them rethink things. Because like you said, like high school needs to be remodeled. It needs to be rethought. It needs to be restructured from ground up because those young adults, because that's what they are at that time. They are young adults, you're right. Are being, their time is being wasted and they're so profound. Like these are kids are brilliant. Kids are, I feel 
Um, I, I did an interview with um, Heidi uh, the other day with Realizing Genius. And I love her name because I feel like all kids are geniuses until they're taught yeah. otherwise. Um, and by yeah. the time they reach high school, they are definitely in the in a mind state of, oh, well, am I like, do I even know anything? Because I've been making B, D, or, you know, like they're, they're associating their worth, their self-worth or their identity with grades at that point. They're like, you know, they've been labeled so many times over from third grade on up. Well, sometimes now as early as kindergarten, they're putting labels on kids. So they're being taught all these things that they are really not. But because they're not following this model or they're not following the standard, they're really being pushed into thinking that there's something wrong with them. And so when you get them in high school, it's like they're they're burnt out. They're, they're burnt out. They're over it. They don't want to do nothing. They don't want to yeah. participate. They're just here because well, they have to be. And I don't know when this happened. I'm assuming, I mean, I'm not an education historian. I'm a, a running on for profit. But like at some point, somebody decided we should have these comprehensive high schools with 5,000 kids. It's the stupidest idea <laughs> ever because nobody is really successful. It's because everyone is just a number. They're a widget, right? It's miserable for the teachers. It's miserable for the kids. It's not possible for a kid to have a meaningful experience, right? Like I, I find, so we're my public high school that my kids are zoned to is a 5,000 kid high school. And it's a quote unquote good school, right? The average SAT score is very high. It's an anonymous place right and they have all the things they have band and they have blah 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 and friday night lights and all the things and and that's really nice but but you're a number right so if you're an average student you're you're invisible mm -hmm. if you're a below average quote unquote student you're gonna get attention but you're not gonna believe you're capable of much and you're not getting you know, anything other than like, let's get you to pass the test. To be average, yeah. If you're quote unquote above average academically, you're going to get a lot of resources and support, but you're still never going to get the individualization. So I, I'm kind of like, whose bright idea was it to have a 5,000 kid high school where everybody's anonymous, right? That's a recipe for kids checking out, dropping it, you know, just being very miserable. And to your point, not inspiring right it's it's in it's um and they've decided and they're young adults who have been told something about who they are and it shapes their narrative their self-talk yeah. it's a very very dehumanizing way to go about educating people and yeah. um it's where you hear kids say the most like whatever. It's stupid. I don't care. I just have to do it. <laughs> or they believe the lies, right? That like um, their GPA is who they are. It's who they are. Yes. It's a lie. It's a total lie, right? Like all, and, and I've had kids, teenagers say, I know what I have to say and write to get an A. Mm -hmm. or a C shoot I used to strive for a C when I was taking German like you know, yeah. yes I know. yes <laughs> I know what I have to do I know what the baseline is to keep my parents off my back to get past the class to just and also to make sure I'm like the administrators leave me alone yes ma'am that is like soul crushing it is it's absurd it's that's absurd. why we get adults that like they literally shut off their learning after high school. It's like, oh, I learned all I was supposed to learn. And like after 18, it's, you know, they just get going in life and just working a job or whatever um, their definition of that they've been groomed to believe it's success is. And they just, the life learning that you hope to create is not there. So I just had a, professor a college professor someone I know who's a professor who's a friend tell me that he has decided to change the entire way he assesses students he's not going to ask for papers anymore he's like I'm not grading papers and I'm not going to do any tests and I was like well what are you going to do he said I'm doing these small what I'm calling small group 
or group authentic real-time assessment. So I will meet with groups of like four students. This is not one-on-one, so it's not high pressure. And we're just going to have a conversation nice. about the t- topics and and the content and the reading and the readings. He's like, I'm going to ask a few questions, but he's like, I can figure out chat GPT can write the essay that they want. He's like, they don't have to read a thing and I'm not going to know it. He said, but if I sit in a room and I say, so tell me, what do you think about the essay when they talked about this, if, you know, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And they might not have read every single thing that semester and that's okay. So someone else might answer that and then they'll go, oh, I didn't realize that, or they skimmed that. And mm-hmm. he's like, I want an authentic assessment. And that's really Socratic. That's talking. That's engaging. And I said, that's what they should be doing in high school history and English. And like, if you really want to know, did you read Huck Finn? Like, so tell me about the second chapter when like, you know, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. If you're, if that student can engage with you, it means they engage with the material. Right. And there's no, and, and, and I was like, that will never happen in a 5,000 kid high school. Mm. Won't happen. You can't do that when you have 90 kids who you have to get through on a block schedule all day. It will never happen. Yeah, no. And so what we're going (laughs) to stick with are scantrons, bubble forms, sit in the rows. We're doing stuff we did in the 1950s and it's 2024. It's (laughs) this is why homeschooling is exploding. Yeah. Right. It's why people are coming together and forming their own schools, whether they're micro schools or small private schools or homeschool groups. I don't see an end to it. I mean, what are you seeing? That's what that's what I but I love it. I love the direction I see things um things going. The micro schools I feel are gonna be a takeover. Um I feel micro schools are going to, you know, lead everything. Um they're gonna be yeah. community based and everyone's going to know of the micro schools. I see everything flipping around as far as us because you're providing choice and and making sure that families understand they have choices and families are going to know they have choices. No more are we going to be programmed to think, oh, when our child gets five, we just ship them to the local private a public school and that be it. Is that's going to be that's that's going to be ancient. That's not going to be the thing anymore. Parents right. are going to approach other parents and be like, oh, okay, how are you educating your child? Or what what kind yeah. of education is your child um, partaking in? Like, what are they doing? What resources are you using? Things of that nature. Parents are going to be back in charge of their children's education um, because I feel like yes. parents have been so, like, prior to 2020, parents were so detached from the whole school, like, oh, this is what my, like, just like I said, yeah. like, you're just programmed to think when your child turns five, it's time for them to go to public school. That's it. Like, there's no questions asked. There's no thoughts given to it. Even though it's wild, Colleen, because you talk to a lot of parents and they'll tell you that their school experience was not good. Like they'll tell you that they yeah. didn't, I didn't <laughs> learn anything in school, but you're sending your child there. <laughs> so what do you feel yeah. like has changed? You see that the model hasn't changed. So why, are you, yes. why do you feel like that's what you have yes. to do with your child? They'll tell you like all the things, you know, the bad things from their school experience, but they, I don't know, I don't know if they some kind, some kind of way, like tell themselves, oh, well, things have changed or, you know, maybe it's better or whatever, (laughs) but. Well, or they just don't, what we find is your point, like there's just this vision, it feels scary. Like, well, what am I supposed Mm -hmm. to do? It's that you revert to what you know, right? Like if, if in the absence of another vision or some Mm. help or somebody saying there's another way let me show you not tell you let me show you what that looks like you're going to revert to what you know because it's safe it feels safe it might be like well uh you know what are my options right that I mean that's where when we get to parents they're like oh my gosh I'm so happy to know I have all these options especially parents say who have kids who are neurodiverse or kids with learning differences who really get, can get soul crushed to your point. Like as soon as first, second, third grade, you know, 
Um, and parents feel like they're crazy. They're treated like they're crazy. I do think though, for us, we saw a massive explode. Like we had massive growth during COVID because you're right. That was the moment nationwide where every parent all of a sudden they were in the classroom saw saw what was happening mm -hmm. right and so you were like wait a minute it, my kid's not the problem this is how you're teaching kids to subtract like what yeah, what are you talking about you know like my kid I said oh you have to borrow she's in my daughter was in third grade she was younger you don't call it borrowing you don't give it back and you have to do baseball estimation. I was like, now we're talking crazy. What are you talking about? You know, and and I taught math. I have an NCTM. I'm now yes. mathematics. And I was like, I can't help you. You can't help me with my homework, mom. You don't know. And then I'm watching all this online, this kookiness and the ridiculous assignments that got sent home. And the older your kids were, the more you really realized what was going on yes, and I, I i think that the level of frustration parents are like wait a minute i am paying property tax upwards of thousands of dollars every year and renters pay tax too the taxes get put into their rent so it's not just homeowners i hate that when they're like well it's only homeowners I'm like no it's not you, you think someone who owns a building is like just paying that property mm -hmm. they're 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 yes, putting that building into so the high. rent yes renters are paying parents are like whoa 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 i'm paying i am paying for this i am the consumer i pay for this and this is this bad teachers not <laughs> showing up for zoom being like i'm too stressed out to teach but like it was like a freak show and i think a lot of parents from that point on even when the kids went back said uh-uh i need to know what's happening here yes i am and young parents no way their whole life is visible they're my kids are on snapchat they don't email them they don't actually <laughs> can talk on the phone right so the, everybody is very visible very oh, out there i'm a little bit like why don't we be a little why are we not more <laughs> private like why are you putting all your business right. out there but young parents have grown up with parents in their 20s, right? And 30, they've grown up being able to design sneakers mm. to be sent to their home. Think about it. I could create sneakers online right now with the sole I want. And we went to like the Adidas store in New York. My daughter's like, can I make my own sneakers? I was like, why do you have to do that? Like any, but, but, you know, like with the sole, with the tread, with the laces, and then they get shipped to your home. And we're customizing everything in our life and we are sending and our schools look like they did in 1950 or 60 or 70. When, by the way, we weren't really doing that well by all our kids. Then they were only designed for a certain small group of people. So yes, the, the glory days were never glorious. That's, that's a myth. So I think really COVID blew the lid off of the myth and a bunch of people got unplugged from the matrix yes. and our, so then the challenge becomes, what do I do now? I can't plug back in. It feels a little scary to go it on my own. But so what you're doing is so great to me because you're really helping to normalize and, and, and make parents feel like they can do it. Yes. They're the most important people. They are not crazy. They are capable. And they love their children more than the state will ever love their Whatever. children, Yes. period. And when that voice in your head goes off that something's wrong, you need to believe it. To you need to yes. listen to it. Yes, yes, Kylie. It's just a reminder. Like you said, you spoke on the parents being the first, their first te kid's first teacher. And it's like, they have to hear that. Cause I have so many conversations in the park, you know, passing out cars and stuff and telling parents, like, they're like, but I don't think I can't. It's like, but you've already been. Like <laughs> you've yeah. been doing it, and they have to. Yes. Oh yeah, like I, I literally see light bulbs go off. Like, like I have. Like 
but it's just so structured in us that it's like, oh no, when they get fine, all that you've been doing, it, girl, doesn't matter. <laughs> Send those children to that building. And you're <laughs> teaching them, you're coaching them, you're loving them. You're actually really holding them accountable too. Yes. A parent will hold their child accountable. And why? Because they love their children. Yes. Right? Like, so, so I think like, you know, the reality is I would hold my kids accountable for doing their work because it matters to me. It's like, okay, you really do have to practice writing because you got to actually learn to write, yes. <laughs> right? Like you really have to understand that one plus one is two and, you know, four minus two is two. Like that matters because I want you to be independent. I want you to have a life of meaning. So the accountability is so much more real for a parent than it is. I mean, I know as a teacher, we had to have a certain number of kids pass. And then there were the bubble kids. Then there were the, 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 the that's how we looked at the kids that we, and I don't, I don't blame anybody. It's the system is too big. It's too anonymous. It's too unaccountable to your point. It's just, you cannot have relationships like you need to with families when you have 5,000 or 500 kids in a physical building. Yes, ma'am. I used to tell people I had 147 students on my roster my last year teaching. It's crazy. How do you be present in 147 households? Like, how are you to take in that that amount of pressure? As, yeah. And then also have your household too. Don't forget about steroids. But to take in the account, because I don't think people really think about that when they think on a teacher level of the fact that you're responsible for all these different households, yeah. like in some yeah, ways. And so you're right. also responsible for safety first, right? So now you've got all these kids in this situation where they're, especially if you were in a high school, <laughs> you are like thinking, okay, first do no harm, right? Like everybody gets in and out of here <laughs> safe. Please. And the reality is when you have that kind of situation, you're going to have a curve. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're in a wealthy neighborhood or poor. You are going to have kids that are struggling with self-control and self-regulation, whatever that looks like. You are going to have a whole bunch, some introverted kids who now have to deal with the fact that you got some kids acting out. Mm -hmm. You are going to have this middle of the road. Like, so you're going to have this bell curve. And your attention usually is on, first of all, do no harm, get everybody through it, get as much information as you possibly can, but you're, there is no way not to be grouping in your mind those kids. And every teacher has had a kid who has struggled with self-regulation or self-control. I have I've had it. And there's lots of reasons for that. But it's real when you're in a room with 30 kids at one time or 40 kids at one time, and you have two kids who cannot manage them, their own behavior. That affects everybody, everybody. in that room. Yes, and man. if somebody gets hurt in that room, that's on you. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a situation where you're, you're managing people. And mm -hmm. trying to like build intimate relationships so that, you know, the kids will trust you. They'll trust each other. It doesn't work that way. No, no. You know, you can have a group, a room of 40 students in college because they're adults who are paying to be there. Totally different. Right. And by the way, they also fail out. Like the ones who don't want to be there are pretty much gone after <laughs> freshman year. <laughs> like they just don't come back. <laughs> Because nobody's going to pay $70,000 to fail, you know, so like, or 40 or 20 or even any money to fail. So I, you know, to me, it, it is, it is impossible to have real relationships and real meaning in these over stretched schools. And then on the flip side, you have schools where you have declining enrollment, where you've got like half the school empty and you know, and the schools need to be thinking about how to actually, I think, work with homeschooling schoolers and say, hey, you want to come in and use the gym? That's mm. great. Hey, you know what? If you want to come in and use our lab, great. 
right? They're all complaining. Absolutely. Oh, I wonder resource. We have like empty schools. They're selling our schools. They're closing our schools. I'm like, why don't you innovate? Why don't you say, hey, why don't we think about creating a community hub here where homeschoolers can actually use the resources, yes, the PE resources, the facilities, the fields, or the lab, the science labs, or the you know music, or the black box theaters, or whatever you have. Or thinking on a more community level in general, I always talk about like how separated schools are from the actual community they are in. Like they're really not like a community structure. Like they should be seen more of as far as like the teachers knowing the neighborhoods, the teachers and the faculty, like in general, being more well-versed in who it is that they're serving, who it is that they're teaching. Because community presence, it makes a big difference. Think about if schools were to put yeah. on block parties before school started, like all the administration, all the teachers and everything, mingling and talking to families as a whole, not just your, not just yes. the student, but knowing the parents, knowing your siblings, knowing like the re relationship. Yeah. Well, and think about this. You, you're homeschooling, you're still paying for that physical building, your property taxes. You are paying the whole community, elderly people, single people, childless people, that building, and then their bonds that they, that physical building really belongs to, to everyone. The community, yes. And this entity technically owns it, right? The, the school district. But they're using public dollars for that building, which, and I think it's kind of insane, right? So then they don't deliver on the education, the academics and the safety and the just sort of humanity that people want. And then you homeschool and then they're like, well, we have declined enrollment. It's so unfair. We have to close the school. I'm like, well, maybe you shouldn't. Maybe what you should do is for a small fee or something, especially in an ESA state, have, mm -hmm. you know, labs have like really rethink these capital physical infrastructure that we have invested so much money, billions of dollars in, Damn. right? I, I don't know. But again, I'm very, I like to be creative and think about what we could do for kids and what we could do and should do for families. I like that you think that eventually schools will get there. I'm yeah. very... <laughs> I'm That's a very optimistic. I'm you. very optimistic, I, love that about you. I am. I like that about you. I, I like am very optimistic. You. Um, because I feel like the challenge, because the decline, they have to respect the decline of teachers as well as students. Like students yeah. aren't just leaving the school, the teachers are leaving the schools. Yeah. And then it has to at some point it's gonna click that, yo, we really got to do something different. Look, if I can homeschool, if like three parents come to me and say, hey, especially in an ESA state, to a great teacher, I'd love for you to teach, to be sort of the coach and the facilitator for our our homeschool group. And oh, by the way, we can pay you for that. Uh, I know a ton of teachers who would jump at that Definitely. because then they get to do what they love what they were put on this earth to do yes, because there's so many good teachers that really are like I'm being put in an institution that feels yes. more like a prison or juvenile detention center than an actual learning institution mm. Colleen girl you don't say it honey <laughs> yeah. I mean, really yeah no really um yeah well <laughs> Oh, this could definitely go further and more and I, I have really enjoyed this but you know what is we're on the hour right yes yes wow. we are do you so usually go a whole hour yes yes um typically typically but not this quickly look not this quickly like sometimes some hours shoot by honey it's just like but we could keep going and sometimes the hour drags like oh shucks like what else can I ask them what else can I you know to get them there but <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, this has been a, a very beautiful, um, very powerful conversation um, and just food for thought, food for thought um, to all that. I appreciate listening. you. Definitely. I really I do appreciate you. you. And I hope that we we stay in touch. And if you know, there's any way that we can help and support what you're doing, definitely want to connect you with Navigated Arizona. 
okay. Caitlin Harris running that effort. So you all need to connect. And I'm just so glad that we met. Yes. last year yes. in so, Chicago. I know <laughs> when it was nice, it was still nice at that time. It wasn't chill, you know, too chilly. Night freezing, time. freezing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've been looking at their weather and it's like, oh, I would never go to Chicago in the winter. It's pretty wild. I was just in uh, St. Louis and I, I teetered with the thought of driving there because it was only four hours from there. And I was like, yeah, no, it's winter time. I'm not going to do that to myself. St. Louis is bad enough. So it's like, no, we're not going to do that. But yeah, tell us where we can find you and your organization. Well, so you can find Families Empowered at www.familiesempowered.org. Uh, that's the best way to find us. Um, and then on there, depending on the state you're in, if you're if you're in Florida, we're really, our, we've got an organization in Tampa. Uh, you can click on that. Um, Arizona, we've got that um but that's the best way to find us nice and, and anyone can reach media? me at any time at c dipple d-i-p-p-e-l at familiesempowered.org okay cool cool thank you so much and before i let yeah. you go i need three things you would tell parents um i know just oh. three i know people would be like oh just three like or some be like three like yeah. so it could go either way but three things you would tell parents to further empower them on their journey um in leading their children's education the first would be trust yourself trust yourself the second would be always ask questions mm. ask questions and the third would be to, to find a community, to find people yeah. who can support you on your journey and who can add, bring value to you um, so that you can be your best self for your kids. Yes, those are very beautiful things. Thank you so much for that, yes. Colleen, this has been amazing and I really appreciate you. Thank y'all for all that you're doing and empowering families. Um, just a further reminder to families that, or to parents in general, that you're not alone. Like this is never right. anything that you have to do by yourself. So do not be afraid and trust yourself. Like Colleen said it a couple of times throughout this conversation. Listen to that, that little voice, that feeling, whatever it is that's telling you, you know what? we may need to seek something different. Listen, listen yeah. and do it yeah. because there are thousands um, of resources available to right. you and your family. There really are um, family people. Individuals are taking the time to create structures, organizations, businesses, everything. Anything that you could think of is available. I promise you it is. And I'm, I'm doing my best to, to um, showcase them as much as I am able to on this podcast. So thank you for tuning in. Appreciate and just remember, you. remember to homeschool your kids. Yes. <laughs>